The Short Fuse podcasts are conversations with artists, writers, musicians, and others whose art reveals our communities through their lens and stirs us to seek change. I'm Elizabeth Howard, the producer and host of the Short Fuse podcast. We've recently introduced reading groups designed to reflect the creative process of the author. Each one is unique. In this first series, we're talking with Gay Wally, the author of the Venus as She Ages collection, six novels. Thank you for joining us. You can learn more about the Short Fuse and our reading groups at shortfusepodcast.com. Thank you. Gay, it's just such a pleasure again to be reading your books with you. As we know, your books have received a number of awards nationally and internationally. The Erotic Fire of the Unattainable was a finalist for the Paris Book Festival Award and has been made was made into a film under the direction of Frank Vitale, who unfortunately could not join us this evening, but will be in one of our groups. The movie is filming on Amazon. And Love, Genius, and a Walk, your play, opened uh, in London in October uh, 2021 after being performed in New York. So you have such a body of creative work. In April, we talked about uh, Strings Attached, which was your debut novel, written in about, what, 1999. And this time we're talking about to any length. And Gay, perhaps you can just frame the book for us. Well, to any length, I think I wrote about 30 years ago. It's different than Strings Attached. It's a bit more jazzy. It's faster, very fast. It's it's about a woman who doesn't quite understand why she can't fit in to prescribe things that are being asked of her. Similar to Strings Attached, is it her background or is it her nature? A little of both. It's a woman who's frightened of getting married. She becomes close friends with a man in prison who sort of brings up for her what's freedom and what she feels she's going to prison in a certain way. But it also brings up for her her own crimes of love. And she starts to sort of look at crime and where does that fit in society. She eventually does marry the person who wants to marry her. She's also more friends with maybe than in love. And then she sees that she's just not suited to it. And in a way, becomes her real self. So it's this journey of really finding out who you really are, I guess. Murphy Lewis, the publisher, is here. from. She's in Paris. So this is what you're, it's midnight, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Really appreciate you joining us. And I wonder if you would like to give us a few of your thoughts on the novel. Mm. Well, as as Gay says, there's that jazzy thing going on. And it's it's when she starts to riff, she riffs twice in a really peculiar way. I don't mean peculiar in 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 odd, but peculiar in the sense that she begins to really kind of reveal her relationship to her mother and her relationship to her father. There are these great, like one is when she's at the wedding and she has an imagination, her mother is there. And then later with her father as she's driving. And um, so you really see her love of music and her capacity to write into her character, the protagonist with this riff, you know, like she's really doing a jazz riff. But I love most of all that she that this book has come out of obscurity. It was really something that was in her file. And I love that it it's come out because it's really the most stylized of all her work. Gay, could you read us one of, one of the riffs? I have the wedding riff. The mother in the book is um, mm. almost a nihilist. She looks down on marriage. She looks down on union. She looks down on being a mother. But you can't get through to her at all. And for the daughter, this is a great pain. She's never, she hasn't lived with a mother since she was four anyway. So friends are driving long distances, buying gift certificates, dresses, and smoking cigarettes in alarm. His family is lending him money and taking planes. But something is missing. What it will be is that when I stand there in my white dress among friends who are kind enough to be encouraging, 
Friends who have lived a lifetime with me, some in just long telephone calls, a knife will go in. I will feel a sharp pierce. Wasn't I supposed to die by now? Don't I know what she knows? Love is in the movies. Sex is motivation for any killing. You're so unique, she said, in marrying. Why not just divorce? Have you no courage? Oh, it's cold, cold, cold glass that you pushed into my ribcage in my white dress. I am not bleeding red on the white dress. Nothing shows. That is my way. I don't turn her in. She trusts that. She knows I'm curious, always curious to see what length she will get up to next. I turn to her specter, grab my rib, and cut my hand as I pick it out like it is nothing, the glass. You don't bother. It's nothing, an accident. I look to her. My life is only an accident. She smiles. Anyone's is. How foolish of you to want to play predictably. Revolution, she sneers. Bourgeois revolution. Are you hurting yet? Sleep with married men in the room, not your boring husband, you fool. I begin listening, some glass still in my rib cage, sinking in now through my blood vessels, but my heart is safe. That is shielded from her, shielded off from her glass. But I find myself leaning toward her while my husband laughs and jokes with the guests. I watch her watching me, watch her shine her lips in her compact glass mirror. Her eyes shine too. She has me. I am the mirror of darkness, not the heart. What a thing. My husband still talking, still talking, and there's no need for words while watching her. I'm already in the boat with her, watching my own wedding through the prism of her white patent leather shoes on the boat to see where is this place she's taking me to. It is so free, so artificially sustained that it can live so well without love. I can see where the title would come from that to any lengths. Yeah, there, everybody goes to any length in this. Well, she goes to any length to sort of, I mean, she goes to prison to find herself and she goes to she marries to find herself only to get out of the marriage. So she's, she's traveling as far as she can go. How, how, how gay did you happen to come up with a prison? I mean, that's a pretty strong metaphor or, you know, or, or if you're using it, you're really not using it necessarily as a metaphor because you have a real person in, in, in prison. Well, I, I, at the risk of being very unoriginal, I, um, I was visiting someone in prison and I got fascinated by the metaphor of prison in a certain way. And at the time, I was thinking about somebody in prison and what it was like and what were crimes and what was the metaphor of prison. But when I reread this book for this meeting, I thought really... Her character is in prison. <laughs> so basically, she's in a prison where she can't sort of get out of. She's caught and she can't be herself till really, till really the end. I think I read this to you the other day. Okay. This, this uh, Diane Wachowski, who is a 60s beat poet, book is Inside the Blood Factory. And one of the poems that, that I've always liked is Rescue Poem. And it's when he diagnosed my case. At, it left me with little hope. You have an invisible telephone booth around you, he said. It is the glass hard cataman whispers cannot penetrate. Glass of cut out tongues and spider tracks of a turn of a bolt, one thread. And of the distance, one hammer blow drives a nail. The space of a snake's forehead and the diamond ladder of a window washer. A shadow foot between the real foot and the ground. And I always think of that when I think of, you know, that we're all in some ways within this invisible telephone booth or, or mm -hmm. are in prison. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, someone has asked, how difficult is it to read something that at one time was so close to you? Yeah, that's a great question. Mm -hmm. Well, Murphy knows this very well. When Murphy brought out these old books of mine, the, the last two are not so old, but the uh, first four are. I really had a hard time with it because I don't identify anymore with the female character's problems mm -hmm. or how she thinks. Mm -hmm. So I felt very, as almost inauthentic. You know, I kind of felt, well, this isn't even me and, and, and I don't like this person. And, and um, I had a very, very hard time. But in rereading this this time, I was able to distance a bit. And I, I thought, well, I mean, and I think Murphy's thinking was that this character is, you know, 
this is something a young woman would be going through, a creative young woman would be going through. It's not what I'm going, but it's, you know, what a younger creative woman would be going through. So it has an integrity in that sense. It's it's hard to read. It's not it's not oh fresh. This is what I feel right now. This is you know, but I think that's true for any writer with old stuff. Did you edit these when you went back through them? I mean, did you? you, you, you not, not much. No, not much. You think Murphy? No, we didn't really, because they had their own form. They had their own integrity of what they were doing. You know, it's just that it was no longer what I was doing. What I was thinking about. You know, I wasn't thinking about getting married or or if I was, I probably wouldn't look at it in the same way. You know, Therese, you mentioned in our last conversation that Gay's book have more emotion than plot. But did you find any difference in this book? Well, I was thinking, I was really curious about the riffs because my experience with writing something like that is that it, it's a rush of emotion and uh, you're like driving this a car that is, uh, you know, just barely staying on the road, or you have accumulated all of these ideas and then you string them along laboriously. And so I was curious what how that worked for Gay. If I recall, I mean, I just hooked into the feelings regarding that those particular scenes, and that's where they came out. So they were mostly emotionally driven, in other words. Yeah, they were, yeah, they were, the riffs were emotionally driven. And as I think you're right, Riffs are emotionally driven. The book itself is mostly in scenes and most, well, actually I go all over the place. I mean, I quote Nazem Hickman. And so they represent a way to get from one scene to the next or to summarize what's going on and then allow you to move forward. So they're in, in that way, they work as a narrative device. Well, she just got married. Yeah. And so in a way... With parents who were sort of anti-marriage and anti-anything, they're not at her wedding, they have nothing to do with any of that. And and she makes her case to them in a riff. Mm-hmm. You know, as one is to the father about, can you believe it? Somebody would marry me, your daughter. Goes on and on and, and wh- why she did it. I mean, it's a great way to pull the narrative forward. You know, even though you're it's a big kind of bomb in terms of, Structure, you know, it's not dialogue and it's not scene set. Yeah. It yeah. rushes forward like that. That's great. But what's interesting, I, I, the, Murphy, like that's the two things that she remembers about it. Robin, you have a question? Mm-hmm. To any lengths, I thought that you had two different reasons for to any lengths. To any lengths for normalcy, that you're going to any lengths to be normal or to any lengths to um, have, find your freedom. That's what I thought the... the, uh, the, the oh, you're uh, right. That's right on, yeah. Mm-hmm. And then your mother is very much in this book, not the first book that much, but the second book, that, that this second book, this book, to any lengths, your mother is very, very important in this book. Uh, your father, I can't, I can't figure out your father from the first book or the second book. And when, <laughs> didn't he get married? Didn't you say he was married many times in the first book? That he got married many times, or did he have many affairs, many women in his life? I think in the first one I said he has many women. And also, remembering now that in about part five, she says, I've solved the crime. My mother didn't love me. So that's where she is a through line to some extent in that way. She's the criminal. Not being loved. Is the mother or being loved by your father? No, not being loved by the mother is the crime she's trying to solve. You've said that she is complicit in the failure of love, but not, but not a victim. I was reading another book, which was extremely well written. It is about a woman who kind of has a screwed up beginning. The book is really about how she is the victim of this background. But I do feel in my books, I'm hoping... But Mike, this character is not so much saying I'm a victim. She's kind of trying to go. She's going to any length to find out what happened. Mm-hmm. And she's looking at her own crimes. Do you know what I mean? It's not so much. I mean, she's complicit in all the mess that she's making. She's aware that she's complicit. She's not saying, oh, it's done to me. She's complicit in her own messes and in her own steps that she takes. 
and and takes I think she takes responsibility or I hope she takes responsibility for it. Anna Duran had her hand up. You know, I guess I come about reading your books in a different way. <laughs> I tend to read for the meta voice, not the literal every sentence kind of thing. I do that at first glance, but then there is a voice that should emerge like it does on a campus, right? It, that maybe you don't know that it's there until you go over it many times and all of a sudden maybe you put it aside and then bring it back two months later and then there's this voice that you don't recognize that has come forward. And so that's what I saw in your book. And one of the things, um, right now I'm writing about out-of-the-box thinkers, so I want you to know what my mindset is. And so I've been looking at people who are thinking about precognition, really unusual ideas. So there was another book competing with your book this last month. The other book that I was reading was called The Psychic Warrior, uh, a story about a CIA agent um, who, it's a true story, and how he becomes involved in this task of, of doing unusual things. So I came at that this with that filter. So. One of the things, it's when I got to the middle of your page 53, you know, where I began to notice again that the I was, there was no name. So mm -hmm. I thought, okay, here we go. There's a silence to the person. And yet your dedication is to all women. So I thought, well, maybe she wants us to get that this is a message to all of us. So I kept on thinking, what is your sense, sense of purpose? And it appeared to be absent until I got to the following page, which was on page 56. And it's when you're, it was visiting your mother or the character was visiting the mother. Mm -hmm. And she says, the mother says, they went to a shopping center of some sort. This is the line that did it all for me. She said she selected a depressed shopping plaza to walk through, not the outdoors, that's everywhere, she said. Then it suddenly dawned on me what your purpose is and the, or the character's purpose is, and that's to be unique. So I felt very satisfied with the ending because I thought, well, this is what you're telling us, that it always takes imagination <laughs> and that you're always going to be experiencing being an outsider because you are unique, and that's the paradox and dilemma that needs to be resolved in some way or another, no matter what your choice is. Right, um, because no matter what you do, it's going to be different. And are you okay with that? And then I think you also highlight the social scene for us, the constant pressures not to be different. And so what's wrong with being different? I guess that's that's what the, I came away from. And then I think you you the ending, the imagination is extremely important in all this. So I don't mm -hmm. want to lose that. Well, you know, that's interesting. That, that leads me to something I was talking about with Elizabeth about the book. Uh, my favorite line of the book is probably not anybody else's favorite line, but the husband wants to marry her and she's having trouble. The paragraph, the paragraph before my line, he pulls hard at my mismatched feet. Move one for God's sake, he yells at me. Make your feet both, both do the same thing. Marry me and get in or get out. I want to, I really do, but what is this obscure calling, calling me so obscurely, it keeps whispering there is something else for me. And I think it is, as you say, the last, you know, it was when my imagination that claimed me became mine and mine to follow, the story began. And in a way, I'm totally agreeing with you because I became very interested. I don't know if you've read Deleuze and Guattari on nomads, not real literal nomads, but people that are not, that don't, that are, as you would say, unique, you know, who don't want to follow the given road, who can't, let me put it. And who won't. <laughs> who won't and can't, and to some extent can't because of the way, whether, and as I said last time, whether it's nature or nurture, who knows? It's, I think it may be more nature. And I think that my characters in all of these books is dealing with that to some extent. There are different things 
that will happen as she ages and she will have different problems as she ages. But there, this thing of not being in the mainstream and not wanting what other people want and not either creatively or romantically or, or uh, financially or in any way, shape or form. And so people have written about this description of nomads and, and talk about the writers, the artists that are nomad types. And I, I don't like Roberto Bolano, David Markson, um, Henry Miller. I'm not putting myself in that league, but I'm just saying that these are people that people didn't get when they came out. So it's a sort of um, she, this calling that is obscurely calling her. She doesn't understand it. She wants the love of somebody. She wants the love of the husband. But she knows she's not suited, that something is not right here. And, and that's really what, to me, and that's why, as you said, the dedication to all women who are frightened of getting married the night before they're getting married. Well, it's just so happened that I'm writing, because I told you last time I'm a technical writer, so in dispersed the two readings I just mentioned, I've also been reading the technical literature and all. But one of the articles, Understanding Psychosocial Well-Being in the Context of Complex and Multidimensional Problems. Okay, so I've been reading about the technical things of <laughs> psychology, uh, identity threat, and um, the idea of psychological safety. So that got into the, my filters as I was reading your book. I would study psychometrics, you know, what are the measures for well-being? So I started to... <laughs> Say, okay, let's take a look because again, I'm technical. So uh, how how is she doing? How is her well-being? <laughs> and one of the factors of well-being is autonomy. <laughs> and, it's, and it's something that's affecting all of us right now in our lives, is being on our own and autonomy. So it's extremely important to be able to think about this may be scary to be autonomous, however. It's uh, an essence of well-being, one of the factors of well-being. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. Yeah, thank you. Margo had a question. How much do you work out your own life through these characters? Totally. I mean, I, I'm, what do they call it? Some say autofiction or some books less than others. I mean, you're going to be reading one where two writers come back to life and take me to Vienna. That, did not happen, unfortunately. But certainly the issues. Yeah, I'm always working on issues. There's a paragraph on page 213. I take a drive after going shopping. This is Manhattan. No one goes for drives in Manhattan. I take a drive to see the sun on the river. I race the car down Harlem River Drive. My husband might even be standing there by the water looking at the strong, difficult currents. Currents that require a tugboat for order. So um, I don't want to argue against the author, but um, and I, you know, <laughs> I agree that the that in a way the character is unique in the story. But the dedication also kind of struck me. Someone brought that up before that it's dedicated to all the women throughout history who got very nervous before their wedding. And I was thinking it's in, in a way, and maybe it's a statement about the time of when the book was written, that it's a universal story, at least for that period, because this was when Betty Friedan's talking about the problem that has no name and marriage as an institution is kind of breaking down. And a lot of women, including myself, were asking the same kind of questions that you were asking in this book is seeing to different ways of, do I really want to get into this marriage? But this is what everybody does. Why would I not want to do this? And then seeing, hopefully, <laughs> models of other women who didn't go that route and really thinking about what society is asking of them. So uh, certainly it's a unique story in the sense of the parents and all that the woman is dealing with. But I think it also, I think it does speak more broadly than that. Do you, would, does that sound all right? No, absolutely. I mean, that's what made me write it. I mean, I, I didn't think I was unique in that way. I don't think maybe that someone 
a lot of women are frightened of getting married, start visiting a prisoner. But I, <laughs> but I think that that's the that's this story. But I do think that. And I think you're right. At the time, women were beginning to think, do I really want this? You know, and, and, and you know, and she says it in the book, you know, I'm, she calls it a crime. Am I going to give myself away as a tender for love, like a prostitute for the, to get love? Sally, do you want to, Paul, can you unmute Sally? When I read the book last summer, and I'm going mostly by, I wish I had my notes with me, um, but I'm down in Florida right now. But when I read it, I'm very, um, very connected with, for some reason, nieces and, and mostly nieces and nephews, but primarily a couple of nieces and a, and a number of young women that are in their 20s and 30s. And I remember um, what struck me about it, especially knowing it was an older book, it really hit me how I could see any of these, these women connect with this. Because I think like a lot of times... Um, we probably think like so many women are just on this very narrow track, especially when you were writing this. It's like either or I'm going to get on track or I'm going to I'm going to be free and an artist or I'm going to get into this like, you know, marriage thing, which is so constricting. And now young women don't even have so many of those choices because things aren't that traditional. But I can what I saw, I remember thinking at the time. It's wanting to be, as a young woman, also wanting to be exciting, wanting to be, you know, sexy and interesting. And, 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 and the fears of that, that getting um, compartmentalized and, you know, just getting taken away by, by a very, you know, by marriage or just by even a relationship that isn't as crazy. But I also saw the whole prison thing as being a freeing thing, not being in prison. But when you, when the character was in the prison, they were free from the outside pressures that as a young woman, you're not making it as a traditional young woman or bride. Here is a place where everybody is an outlier of, of one sort or another. And you're at home as an artist also. So I didn't really see the prison as being like that you're a prisoner of that, but but more of like a place that you could go and hide out and let your, and even your sensuality and sexuality is limited because you can't really act out all in prison in that particular background. But it really hit me that this writing is so current and that I really just, I, I think like, I'm meaning to do that. I will send these books to some of my 20 and 30 year olds because I really don't think there, this is at all dated, which is wonderful. I also just loved your descriptions of the prison and of the women that visited prisoners, their, their lovers. And I mean, their bright colors. And I just thought, I just, there were so many things in this book I thought were great and so real. And so, I mean, very, very like, they just felt real to me. So anyway, that's it. I don't know if any of that made any sense, but I'm now going to send this book to everybody under 35. That's my commitment. Okay, good. I need some everybody, copies. So I know, um, Murphy will be glad. Send it to everybody. <laughs> <laughs> but it would be yeah, nice to invite them um, to join our group. It would be nice to have different generations. I mean, that would yes. you know, that would that would really add to the discussion to see how they're reading yes. it. How a twenty-five year old is reading it in a very different way than uh, Robin. What we, what did you want to say? I was writing about the first of all. I don't know if young women would would know the fear of getting married or not getting married. Would know what what. We would we would understand it as prison or not prison. I don't think they would feel, feel that nowadays. I have forty seven year old daughters in law that I don't think that it would be a problem. I don't think they would feel prisoners. I think they have yeah. their own lives and they would not feel that they're giving up anything. Right. Mm -hmm. I don't think it was the same. It's the same thing. I felt the same thing you did. I did get married. I stayed in a marriage and I felt constantly a prisoner, constantly. And I didn't feel that I, 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 
I just always felt kind of, I did understand what you went through, but I don't think young women nowadays would feel that way. Depends on the woman. It would depend on the woman. But I think our, nowadays we're very much in conflict. I don't know how many younger women feel that conflict. Yes, I'm sure there are some women who do. But, but as Anna just said, the marriage rate has sharply declined, which is true. Yes, yes, probably, yeah. But anyway, I, I, you, you talked about not really fitting in, not really uh, uh, trying to be uh, different. That bra story in the prison is something about going against rules that you put yourself through that, that you walked around, you walked in that, that place without a bra you knew supposed to wear a bra and yet you did that and you put yourself through that challenging challenging the rules challenging the mores and yet you knew that you were going to have trouble doing that and and you you did try to you did try to acquiesce to the rules after after the after a while but you did walk in without a bra and you knew that you were going to have trouble with it so you you probably were always biting the rules and that was mm-hmm. probably the way you did things. Because mm-hmm. at first, couldn't understand, why, did, why did you do that? You know, why would you do that? But that's probably your, your style. And yeah, she's, she's, she's a bit heedless. Does she have regrets as we proceed through the books? Are you talking about generally or about this? Does she regrets about marriage or regrets about anything? Yes, in, in terms of, you know, the arc of the whole endeavor here, does she eventually begin to regret these decisions or she goes forward accepting that she's made these? Well, you know, it's interesting. I, I, I don't know if this is common to all of us or not. I mean, she, this is book two. Book three has a very inverted happy ending, but it's a bit explosive getting there. Mm-hmm. Um, book four is not a happy story, but she learns something. Book five and six, where she's older, are much more cheerful mm-hmm. and much more, there's equanimity. So I think she's at peace. She has her, there's always something going on in a book. I mean, there's always obstacles and all the problems, but, but she's herself by that time. And she's even in book four, but uh, she makes some bad decisions. Anna brought up, She looked up research on women who visit prisons. I did too. I don't know if it's in this book or in prison sex. There's a discussion a little bit about that. What I read about it was that they are, I don't think it's in this book, but they tend to be, at least the studies I read, that they tend to be maternal. There's a sort of maternal quality and they're sexually repressed. So is there there something, since we are reading prison sex next, Is there a continuation? Prison Sect is written differently in that you are in the heads of three characters who are all in their respective prisons. And then there's an explosion and they get out. So it's a bit different setup. This one is just this I character going through. But Prison Sect is not like that. If I may, um, I look at the technical articles I look at have a precision they're in professional journals that have been vetted. So that's the material I look at. They're not popular articles. They're more technical psychology articles. And you could take this with a grain of salt because I always ask questions about how the research was done and I didn't have time to look at it. But it does not present a glamorous profile of women who go to visit prisons. It's not the maternal thing that drives it. It's something more about their previous lives and they usually have involved a great deal of trauma. Visit men particularly and then become their partners in some way or another. So they figure out ways of being able to relate to these men that they they visit. But it's the picture is not one that I don't want it to be seen as um, something that young women should do. (laughs) No, no, no. Yeah. yeah, um, so that that's really important to understand. But also, I, I felt that the descriptions, I look for privilege, white privilege specifically in this book and to see where it might raise its head. <laughs> so the descriptions of prisons, I'm not so sure 
have a person of color point of view on it in it, but I don't know uh, who the character saw in prison, you know, if she uh, uh, saw color in there at all. So I didn't get that idea. I was waiting to be surprised though um, about the, the man that she was seeing. <laughs> and, yeah. um, and I was wondering, was he of color or not? But the, uh, the this tiny bit of glimmer of privilege that I get is on page 80. I read your clubs, your material very closely, Day. <laughs> That's fine. Yeah. Uh, emerged when she's leaving and she says, I stop at the payphone to cancel my American Express. That's me. <laughs> mm -hmm. Who has an American Express card? Yeah. Which populations at that time, anyway? And what are the requirements for an American Express card? So that led me immediately to believe that the character definitely met those requirements for Amex card. So um, so that tuned me into this idea of privilege um, happening there and made me think about the prisoners that were observed and who was it that she was seeing? Okay. Well, I mean, I, I wasn't trying to get into a social thing, discussion. No. Prisoner, prisoners. He, I, on purpose, he is a nonviolent crime. It's marijuana. It was a Rockefeller laws where they did a lot of time for marijuana. That was the only thing, but I was not trying to. Now, the, interestingly enough, if I was writing this now, would I have a, yeah. a different, as they say, different gaze? At the time, I was not looking to get into that. And is she privileged? Yeah, she's white and she's sort of, you know, I mean, I wouldn't say she's rich. She seems to always be struggling in her own way, but she's working. She's this, she's that. So I, you know, th this is definitely not a typical prison story. In the next one, you do see a little bit more about the women who go to prison. Well, it made me wonder, you know, because you we were asking about uh, younger women and how they might feel about it. It made me think about if women of color, of which I'm one, uh, would experience this idea of relationship in a different way because the way that the social dynamics play out, it's very, very different for non-white groups than it is for white groups in many cases, not all. But it made me think about that filter. And um, while the books weren't about it, directly, indirectly, you know, it, it, it does emerge to a reader like me. So I have a different truth to follow and um, set of values that I pay attention to. So anyway, it jumped out at me. Um, so just uh, my 10 cents. <laughs> no, 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 I, I appreciate it. Um, where's Ann Gibbons? Did you have something to say? I was going to just, con my, this is totally not a non sequitur, but but what I was struck by earlier when you were talking about her going to any lengths to find herself, to fit in, to rebel, or, you know, to be different, to, to be unique, that, that the character gets married as a way to find herself. That, that, that like when she saw marriage as, oh, I don't have to stay forever, then it became this freeing thing. And so it was ironic to be doing the conventional thing as a way toward autonomy. That, yeah. Well, I yeah, just I, thought it was interesting that they kind of all very interesting. Yeah. 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 That's definitely true. What was going on? I, I have to ask you, Jay, the person I know you did know someone in prison. Um, did he mind your writing about this? Or what does he think about that's very that's a great question. <laughs> He's out now. He he was sentenced to 25 years for marijuana, which to me, it was absurd. He knows that I wrote some books, two books with the prison in it, and um, he can't read them. Oh, he won't. I mean, yeah. I mean, whether that's to do with me or whether the student doesn't want to go there, whether you know, I, I don't ask him, but um, I know that he just can't. I know that he can't read. Them. Mm. So, Marco's asking, can you explain a little bit about either using yourself or not using yourself. I mean, that kind of gets back to the auto fiction. You know, yeah. when is it a character and when is it, I, I guess, memoir of some type? Well, you know, it's very freeing to be able to, I mean, I would be terrified to write a memoir. I'd have to be truthful. I'd have to be, 
I don't know what the right word would be. I um I would have to be truthful. I don't particularly go into these things. It's not that I'm lying about myself. Well, maybe I am sometimes. I mean, they're not all completely true. They but they do have my personality, a lot of them. So so I am being free with myself, you know, and I'm doing whatever the hell I want to do with myself. There's a freedom in that that I like. I can use my emotions to help my language. And I can, but I, I can take the car off the road. But doesn't that really just mean you're, you search for an emotional truth? Yes. Yeah. But I'm free to go off the road. To, make, um, to get to the emotional truth. Yeah. Yeah. Or take off to where, to not my emotional truth, but to an emotional truth, you know? So there's a certain freedom. I, I, I disagree with that because I think having looked at your work for a long time, you're always looking for emotional truth when people are always asking you to tidy it up and make her happy at the end. No, does she do that? No. So I would trust yourself. Now, how could you give away the end of all these books? (laughs) Um, But anyway, um, I've had the pleasure of working with Therese all these years. So much fun. Yes, but that's an emotional truth. And Therese has a new book coming out. So once that's out next spring, we'll do a book, re- we'll do a, a reading yeah. around that book. Yeah, absolutely. It sounds like we could really go on, but I think it's good to keep, keep within our parameters. So the next June 28th, which is a, t- I'm losing track of the time, which is a Tuesday evening prison sacks, which looks like a pretty interesting book. So as I say, Murphy, Gay, anything about about reading this that that you want to? Murphy, what do you what you you're you're more sane about all this? <laughs> well, what I think is great about prison sex are really the character studies. You do an amazing job of helping us to understand each character. It's like you take to any links and embody those three characters, and we really get to know them. And I think you'll really enjoy reading it if you haven't because of that. It's really, it's um, a, maybe a deeper book and enlightening, I think, around too many links. Well, thank you so much for coming. 